NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How's everyone tonight? Good, thank you very much for coming out between the Thursday night football, the baseball game, and the candidate dinner thing. We're really grateful you made it out tonight. <laughs> so, the ability to rove the surface of Mars has revolutionized JPL missions. With more advanced mobility, new targets like cliff faces, cave ceilings, and the surfaces of asteroids and comets could potentially be explored. Tonight's talk will present the work of JPL's Robotic Rapid Prototyping Lab, which is currently working on grippers for NASA's Asteroid Redirect mission. This mission plans to extract a 20-ton boulder from the surface of an asteroid, then actually alter its orbit using a method that could be used to prevent future asteroid impacts with Earth. Our guest will also talk about other inspired adhesives and designs currently being tested on Earth and in space. Tonight's guest is the group leader of the Extreme Environment Robotics Group at JPL and the head of the Robotic Rapid Prototyping Laboratory. He received two bachelor's degrees from MIT in mechanical engineering and creative writing and an MS and PhD from Stanford University in mechanical engineering. At JPL, he currently works on the asteroid redirect mission, leading a team that is developing the robotic grippers for the spacecraft. Additionally, he formulates and leads several technology development projects and also assists work in JPL's Office of the Chief Scientist and Chief Technologist. He and his work have been featured in The Economist, Time Magazine, and as a popular science top 100 innovation of the year, as well as on the Discovery Channel, BBC, and in JPL's own Crazy Engineering on YouTube. In 2015, he was awarded one of JPL's highest honors, the Lou Allen Award, which recognizes individual accomplishments or, or pardon me, individual accomplishments or leadership in scientific research or technological innovation by JPL employees during the early the early years of their professional careers. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome tonight's guest, Dr. Aaron Parness. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, it's my honor, actually, to talk to you tonight about our robotic grippers. Uh, let's see here. So we have three basic technologies you'll learn about. On the left is a gecko-inspired adhesive. Geckos use lots of tiny hairs on the surfaces of their feet to stick using van der Waals forces. In the center is a physics that we all learned when we were about five or six years old, walking with wool socks across the carpet to shock our siblings or rubbing the balloon on our head to get it to stick to the wall. So we're able to harness that for sticking to things in space. And on the right, you see uh, an insect-inspired adhesive method using claws or hooks. This is good for penetrable surfaces like uh, soft rocks or wood uh, and for rough surfaces that are um, very sturdy like volcanic rocks. So the talk is broken up into four chapters. We'll start with ARM, the Asteroid Redirect Mission, and then we'll move actually backwards in time to talk about our rock climbing robots. These have been in development for about 10 or 12 years now. The third chapter is on the gecko-like adhesives, and we'll wrap up with a montage of videos and, and photos of some of our prototypes uh, in the lab. And I'll try and touch on uh, the iterative design principles we use and the rapid prototyping techniques that enable us to make these robots uh, very fast and very cost effective. Okay, so ARM, the Asteroid Redirect Mission, it's a NASA mission, JPL is leading this mission, uh, but there's a lot of partners. So Goddard Space Flight Center is developing the capture module um, with significant contributions from Langley uh, as well as some teams back here at JPL. Uh, Glenn Research Center is developing a high-power solar electric propulsion system for this mission. And Johnson Space Center is working on a follow-on mission that would send astronauts to the boulder that we're collecting off the surface. The spacecraft itself is going to be built by an industrial partner, and that's in competition right now. So there are four finalists competing to see who will build the, the bus. 
So an animation here shows uh, the mission during the surface phase, which is a really critical phase of the mission. We're scanning the asteroid. It's a giant spacecraft. So from tip to tip, those solar arrays are about 40 meters, uh, or over 120 feet, much larger than an NBA basketball court. We need all that power for that high power solar electric propulsion system, which is really good for pushing heavy things like 20 ton boulders around in space. As we land, we're gonna absorb that landing with the legs, uh, try and cushion ourselves and use our thrusters to make sure we don't bounce, uh, as was what happened to the Philae lander um, on the comet about a year ago. Asteroids are actually notoriously hard to land on. The Japanese also failed in an attempt about 12 years ago with a mission called Hayabusa. So we'll use dexterous robotic arms to place grippers onto the surface of this boulder. And I lead the team that's developing these grippers. First, we'll grab onto the outside of the rock and then use that grip to support a drill that penetrates into the rock about four or five inches, which creates a really strong anchor point to pull that boulder off the surface. Now, the boulder has a mass of about 20 tons, but on an asteroid, it only weighs one or two pounds, and that's because the gravitational environment is so low. So we're actually more worried about forces like cohesion between the, the regolith and the boulder than we are about the weight of that boulder. Once we have it back off the surface, we're gonna wrap it up tight so we can bring it back to the Earth-Moon system. We're gonna do some other cool things with it before we depart the asteroid. So the high-level goals for ARM, the first one is demonstrate the ability to alter an asteroid's trajectory. So nudge it out of the way if it's coming to hit Earth so it's a near miss instead of a dinosaur killing kind of event. The second one is to get that boulder. And we're gonna put that boulder in orbit around the moon uh, where it's safe and it doesn't risk any damage to the Earth or any of our assets in, in Earth orbit, but where it's accessible to astronauts uh, in a follow-on mission and potentially others as well. You may have heard about some of these companies that have started up recently trying to mine asteroids we might make that boulder available to them uh, as sort of a practice resource close to home. The third key goal is to demonstrate technologies for NASA's journey to Mars. Uh, the journey to Mars is NASA's plan to send humans to the surface of Mars in the late 2030s or, uh, or 2040s. To do that, we need a few key technologies we don't have today. One of those is the SEP, the ability to push those heavy things around the solar system. This would be habitats, fuel, a rocket to get us back off the surface of Mars, food, water. Uh, we wanna stage all of that at Mars before we ever send the crew uh, out there. Uh, and we need this high power SEP to get it there. We'll also demonstrate robotics. Uh, any human mission to Mars is gonna be a collaboration between robots and astronauts. And so we'll take the first steps in that here. And in the follow-on mission, ARCM, the Asteroid Redirect Crewed Mission, We'll be doing EVAs at the boulder, um, the first time doing astronaut activities beyond low Earth orbit since the days of Apollo. And we would use the Orion spacecraft and the SLS rocket for that. So the first one of those goals always gets the attention, right? We're gonna push an asteroid out of the way so it doesn't hit the Earth. So I, I got some of my jokes from the popular uh, media and here you can see we, we've already had our get out of jail free card. Uh, the dinosaurs saved the mammals uh, when the first uh, uh, extinction event came along. The other one I like, uh, here are two dinosaurs sitting together, and in case you can't read the bottom, uh, one of them is saying, uh, I'm saying now is the time to develop technology to deflect an asteroid. Uh, so I, I couldn't agree more. Now, some of you may have said, I've seen this movie before. Uh, what's scary is the interns that we get into our lab, some of them haven't seen this movie and they don't remember it. Um, but we send Bruce Willis, right? If an asteroid is coming to hit the Earth, put a nuclear bomb on the surface and, and obliterate it, right? And that's one possible method. And if it was coming really fast and, and we didn't have a lot of time, that might be the method that we chose. But there's actually several other ways that we might deflect that asteroid. Uh, uh, and some of them don't require launching a nuclear bomb off the coast of Florida. The method we've selected is a gravity tractor technique. We're not sure if it's the best technique. Um, we don't know, we haven't done this before, right? But 
but it's the technique we think we can achieve with this mission. And so we collect that boulder and the combined mass of the spacecraft and the boulder is enough that when we hover in a halo orbit on one side of the asteroid, the gravitational attraction between us and that parent asteroid will slowly tug it over the course of several months and change its orbit. So we're, we're tracking all of the potentially hazardous asteroids that are gonna come and hit the Earth. By the way, nothing to worry about for the next 50 to 100 years. Um, but we're tracking them, and so we could send one of these missions out in advance, demonstrate that we've pushed it off course, and then continue to track it to confirm that it is, in fact, um, no longer a threat. So to get that boulder to increase our mass, to make that gravity tractor extra effective, we're going to use these grippers. So two of these grippers that are about yay big are going to grab that big boulder you see in the back. And that's a mock-up that's at the satellite servicing lab out at Goddard Space Flight Center. So how do you grab a rock? We use a technology called micro spines. They're basically sharp hooks in flexible suspension structures. So you drag them along the surface and they opportunistically catch hold of uh, bumps, pits, ledges, ramps, holes. Uh, they only need really small roughness, so it's much smaller than what you might grip with your hand. In fact, in these prototypes, we're using fish hooks. So you can imagine dragging a sharp fish hook across a rock. It's going to uh, catch pretty readily. A key feature of these microspines is that when they catch, they don't prevent their neighbors from also trying to search out a good place to catch. So they load share. Each microspine only holds one or two pounds of force, but you can use them by the thousands and only need 10% or so to support a really large uh, load. So here's what one of those looks like as it drags across the surface. You can see the hook catches, and when it catches, you'll notice the yellow sort of rubber band-like feature in the back stretches out. That's when it's supporting that one or two pounds of force. And again, we only need 10% of so of these to catch in order to support the loads we need for the mission. So in order to grab a rock, we need more than just that, that tip. Um, rocks are rough on a macro scale as well as a micro scale. And so we use a hierarchical <laughs> compliance to try and conform to the rock's geometry at all of the different length scales. And since we're doing this in microgravity, we use oppositional microspines. So they're reacting against one another. They're all squeezing towards the center so that you don't need any gravity to load them up. Um, and they can support forces that you might exert in any different direction. And of course, since we're going to an asteroid, we, may, we better make sure that they can withstand the extreme environment that we're going to find there. So this is vacuum, potentially very cold temperatures as well. So those rubber band-like features I showed you before, those are not going to work. So we've done a lot of uh, development to make metallic versions of microspines that can withstand those cold temperatures. On the first point, the hierarchical compliance, most natural surfaces have fractal roughness, meaning they're rough at every length scale you look at. So as you continue to increase your magnification with the microscope, all you see is the same level of roughness. So to match that, we use a hierarchical system um, that can conform at all of those different length scales. So the microspines grip at the millimeter scale. We put those into cassettes that can uh, conform to the rock at centimeter scale. And we use the robotic arms to place us in position at the 10 centimeter, 100 centimeter scale. So you can see that in action. Here, you've seen some of these microspines have caught. They've stretched out. They're sharing the load between any of them that have stretched out here. Let's see. You can see these have caught, and then these here have not caught. So this is more than 10%. We have a, a very good grip. You can see here some of that centimeter scale compliance. Some of these cassettes have uh, uh, gone to different angles to conform to the rock, and some of them have squeezed in closer to the gripper. Another demonstration, you can see both, both of those levels happening here and supporting some force. So this is uh, about uh, 25 pounds, 30 pounds on the left, and, and 20 pounds on the right with some of our early prototypes. Here's a video that's showing you how that works. We have two uh, actuations, two mechanisms that are at play here. One that puts those cassettes up and down, and the other one that squeezes them in towards the center. 
So the idea is you come into the rock, you deploy your microspines, they all conform to whatever roughness they find, you squeeze together, and now you've got a good grip. You just reverse that process to let go. So it's a reusable gripper. Here's some of the work we've been doing to make these microspines space grade. You can see some of the early prototypes in the upper left when we were using those rubber band-like polyurethane flexures. We used some extension springs, the kind of thing you would find in like a ballpoint pen. Uh, and then we used these sort of curly Q flexures where we started using the aluminum itself as the spring material. If you look in the center, you can see we went to sort of zigzag-like flexures. And on the right, we've actually been gluing in very thin steel ribbons that are acting like a leaf spring to provide that compliance, mimicking what the rubber band does. In the lower left, we've been experimenting with different kinds of hooks. So we have a fish hook, which is a you know, conical point. We've also been looking at razor blades, so more of a shovel tip, and some more exotic things even than that. These are now being carried on a linkage, and here you can see some of this iterative design I mentioned at the beginning. We've gone through about four different linkage topologies with multiple designs at each one of those um, iterations. And we're trying to make sure that the microspines all make contact with the rock and that as we drag them along the surface, the angle doesn't change too much. And that's true whether we're on a flat rock or a round rock. So we've been playing around with the four bar linkage parameters to try and optimize that. But you can't just build the prototype, you have to test the prototype. And so here's a test stand for a single cassette. We're able to execute a motion um, where we bring those microspines into the rock, drag them along the surface, and there's a six axis force torque sensor behind the rock. So we're measuring all of the forces uh, during that whole procedure. I think there's a video of this. Yeah, so here you go. This is a very soft rock. Uh, we're going to a carbonaceous chondrite which is a type of asteroid that is uh, usually considered to be softer than the stony asteroids, the S-types, or the metallic asteroids, the M-types. <laughs> but we chose a C-type asteroid because it has the most water content and has the most carbon-rich molecules, so it's scientifically very interesting. Uh, in fact, some folks believe that asteroid and comet impacts actually seeded the primordial soup put the building blocks of life onto the planet during the late bombardment period that helped uh, uh, spark life on our planet. So we want to investigate what are those carbon-bearing molecules that are on the surface of these C-type asteroids. Now what you probably can't see very well in the, in the lower right corner there is a plot of the forces. So during the drag force, that blue line goes up because we're having a lot of force along the surface. And then when we start to raise the the center, um, which is out of frame, you see the red line go up, which is the adhesive force we're getting pulling away from that rock. So we can use this test stand to optimize both the microspine design and that linkage design. And it sure beats making a thousand microspines every time you have a new design. But in order to estimate what that grip strength would be, we do a statistical method called a Monte Carlo simulation to try and predict what a grip strength would be out of a distribution of 20 or so tests. Of course, every once in a while, we do make a full gripper. So this was a 2.0 gripper. Uh, it was worked on in collaboration with Thomas Evans at West Virginia University, who provided the robot arm to do testing. So this gripper has about 650 microspines. It's got them in two different rings. And it turns out that was a bad design. Uh, so in the 3.0 gripper, we went back to just one ring. The reason it was bad is because the inner ring and the outer ring would be at different angles if you were on a flat rock versus a curved rock. And so the angles of those hooks essentially meant one ring was very effective and the other ring was not effective. So we just decided, let's just pick one ring. You can see the same kind of uh, data coming in in the upper left as we're starting to support loads. In this test, we get up to, uh, that, that's about 100, 120 newtons um, before you see a slip uh, and then it, it reattaches and starts to grip again. A question we get all the time is what happens if there's dust on the surface? And since the, sh the hooks are very sharp, as long as that dust isn't too deep, they'll just dig right through it. And so here you can see a prototype that was built um, where we're able to pull out a rock that is completely covered uh, in dust. And so on the asteroid surface, it may be a dusty environment but we don't expect that dust layer to be so deep that we won't just cut right through it. 
So some of the prototype evolution, uh, we started with rapid prototype, 3D printed parts, moving as fast as we could, designing in plastic. And then we move into the aluminum grippers, which are larger. That's the actual size we're going to fly on the mission. So we call this the 2.0 tool. We actually built two of those grippers at that size. So here's 2.1, has some slightly different electronics and different microspines, the hoop flexures down there, uh, where we were testing out some, some new concepts. Currently, we're actually building the 3.0 tool. So this is coming together right now. You're seeing pictures hot off the presses. This is maybe a day or two ago we took this one. This is our drivetrain. Uh, it's basically like the gearbox or the transmission in your car. It's got a two-state clutch, and it powers six different mechanisms in the tool. The 3.0 tool is actually much more complex than the 2.0, 2.1, any of the previous tools, because we've added a rotary percussive drill down the center. Here's an underside view of this, of this drivetrain. And here's that drill. So it's a little hard to make out everything that's going on, but you've got things like your chuck, which is how you connect your drill bit to the drill, uh, a spindle, percussion, so this is a hammer drill, uh, an anchor deployment, I'll talk about that in a little bit, and a feed mechanism. And we're lucky because at JPL there's been a lot of development work already on how to drill uh, in outer space. So Curiosity, of course, has a drill, a rotary percussive drill, and the Mars 2020 mission which is a bit ahead of us in the development timeline, has also got a drill. So we've tried to leverage um, all of the lessons that they've learned and all of the design experience they have, uh, incorporating those things into our drill. <laughs> Here's the tool in its current state as it's getting assembled. So it's only the drill and the drivetrain right now. The gripper is still getting put together. Um, but that drivetrain is, is really complicated because we've made a choice not to fly motors inside our tool, but instead to use the motors that are in the robotic arm to drive our tool mechanically. So there's a tool drive output at the end of the robotic arm, and we're using those outputs to power our mechanisms. Trouble is there's three outputs on the robotic arm, two rotary and one linear, and we have six mechanisms on our tool that we need to operate, that we don't have to operate them all at the same time. So we use a clutch. Same way you don't drive your car with all the gears running simultaneously. We index between whether we're gripping or drilling or anchoring. So this ended up being pretty complex, um, but what I think is some pretty beautiful hardware. I'm a mechanical engineer, though, so I like, I like all these kinds of pictures. Now, with that drill, our operations get a little bit more complex as well. <laughs> So we allow the robotic arm to bring us into contact with the surface and align us, make sure our drill bit's facing um, orthogonally to the rock wherever we are. Then we deploy the gripper. We bring those, those cassettes down onto the rock and then squeeze them in to establish a grip with all of the microspines. Once we've got that grip, we're able to drill. The gripper is basically there to react the forces and torques of drilling in microgravity. An analogy I like to use is if you're on an asteroid and you've got your, your drill that you use at home, if you push that drill bit into the surface, on an asteroid you're going to be pushing yourself into outer space. And if you pull the trigger on that drill to start drilling, it gets worse because you're going to start spinning around <laughs> the drill bit instead of the drill bit spinning in the borehole. So we use a microspine gripper to react those loads and make sure that the drill goes into the rock and make sure it, it spins and, and the robot and the spacecraft don't spin. So once we've drilled to a certain depth, we do an anchoring process. We actually cut a groove in the bottom of the borehole that locks us in geometrically to the rock. So we do that by flanging out some little cutters, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second. But that creates a very strong anchor that we're now able to pull on with thousands of newtons of force to extract the boulder off the surface. So of course we have to prototype this. So we've put a drill down the center of our 1.0 grippers. And because we were prototyping, we used the best, quickest, dirtiest drill we could find, which was at Home Depot. It was a Bosch rotary percussive drill. We chopped it up, put the innards into our own motor, and then had a, had a prototype working where we were practicing drilling into rock, uh, I think within about one summer. Uh, you can see on the right, it's actually anchored itself to the ceiling and is not only supporting the weight of that whole assembly, but is also drilling into the ceiling. So it's supporting the loads uh, it takes to drill into the, into the ceiling. 
Now that's a harder than zero G test going into the ceiling. Microgravity is actually true zero G. So what we did was fly on the vomit comet and test this mechanism. Now, show of hands, who's heard of the vomit comet? All right, that's about three quarters. That's a good audience. You guys are well educated. For those that don't know, it's an airplane that NASA operates that flies a parabolic trajectory. So basically the airplane throws you up into the air and then tracks you as you're in free fall, as you're experiencing zero G as you would in space. Um, and then you go into a nose dive and at the last second they pull out of that parabolic trajectory. They basically catch you and you experience double gravity for the rest of the, the bottom part of the parabola. And then they go right into the next one and just throw you in the air again. So you get about 20 or 25 seconds of zero G where you're floating around. It's very zen. People ask if it's like a roller coaster. It's, it's not. It's very um, calm. But then when they catch you and you go into double gravity and you're glued down against the floor, that feels a little bit more like a roller coaster. And they give you very strong motion sickness medication so that you, you don't um, have the effect after which the plane is named. <laughs> so what you see here is our prototype. It's on a Stewart platform. And that Stewart platform is on air bearings that have brakes. So basically the whole drill and the rock float during the zero G portion, but when we go into the two G portion, those brakes seize up and lock everything in place. So it's a way for us to um, not have our hardware crash into the floor uh, every one of those parabolas. And by the way, on a single flight, they do 40 of those back to back. So it takes about an hour um, and, and it's exciting. We've done, I've done now 12 of these flights. So I have just over an hour of zero G time. So if I keep up this pace, um, I'll never catch up to the astronauts, but it's always fun. Now, this is my favorite video for another reason. You see all the debris coming out. This is my favorite video I'm going to show all night, um, but it's sort of for, for nerdy reasons. Um, you see all that debris coming out, and that's a barometer to tell what part of the spacecraft a person works on. So if you show this to robotics people, they're like, oh, this is awesome. That's so cool. And you know that they're used to interacting with the surface. If you show it to someone and they have very pale face and, and start to shake, you know that they work on camera systems or remote sensing or they have delicate equipment that's back at the, at, uh, at the back side of the spacecraft. So on the actual asteroid mission, we'll have a shroud. We'll make sure we catch all of this debris um, so that it doesn't contaminate uh, all the other activities we're going to be doing. Now, the, the final reason I think this is so cool is you can see that dust cloud kind of shift a couple of times during the video, right? And this is, I didn't know this until I saw this video and asked the question. I thought a computer was, was flying this, the airplane. Turns out it's actually the blue suitors, the, the, the pilots, who are manually steering, trying to keep you in that sweet spot of zero G. And so every time you see that dust cloud uh, change directions, they're making a small adjustment, trying to keep the plane in that perfect free fall. So it might be 0.01 G, minus 0.02 G, and they're actually very talented at, at keeping you in that perfect zone throughout the 20, 25 seconds that you have to do your experiment. So a little bit more about the anchoring drill bit. That's a prototype on the right that we test in pre-drilled boreholes. So we drill with a commercial drill. We put this prototype in and then practice the anchoring um, procedure only. And you can see in the, in the colorful uh, diagrams there how those anchoring teeth flare out. And so this happens at the bottom of the borehole as you're still spinning the drill, but you're not pushing the drill in any further. And so what you're left with is a little groove. I hope you can see this one. Um, a groove in the rock that you can pull on with a lot of force. So here you can see again where we've cut one of these open. Um, you can see where that groove was cut and where those teeth were actually pulling. So we've been able to pull on some of these rocks up to a few thousand pounds. Um, and we've tested on all different kinds of rocks. Because we've never been to the surface of an asteroid, we don't actually have a very good uh, understanding of the strength of the boulders that we're going to find there. So we have meteorite data and we have bolide data, which is um, measurements when asteroids hit the atmosphere, at what point they break up. And from those two sources, we can make some guesses about how strong the rocks are on an asteroid, and specifically on a C-type asteroid. But the range is pretty big, like two orders of magnitude. So we have to design a very robust tool. Now, it's going to seem like I'm kind of cutting this portion of the talk short, 
and that's because it's a work in progress. So you've literally seen all the way up to where we are today. Um, we're planning towards a launch in 2021. So if you keep following the news, you're going to see a lot more about the ARM mission, Asteroid Redirect mission, and you'll see all of our good results from that 3.0 tool. But now we'll move into the second phase of the talk, second chapter. <laughs> we'll, we'll look at some rock climbing robots that we've built. So on the right, that's uh, Christine Fuller and I out at the Mojave Desert climbing in some lava tubes, a place called Pisca Crater. Here's our rock climbing robot, and, and people ask, why would you want a rock climbing robot, except that it's super awesome. Um, <laughs> it turns out that there are a lot of places on Mars and other planets that we can't access with the six-wheeled rocker bogey rovers that we have now. So we see stratified layers in the rock on outcrops on Mars, but we can't get to them. We've tried, actually, but because the rovers can only drive on a 20, maybe 30 degree slope, we can't actually access those outcrops. And if anyone's been to the Grand Canyon, you see those different layers and they tell you, oh, you can look back in time by looking at the different layers, right? The oldest ones being at the bottom. So that's true on Mars as well. And wouldn't it be great to deploy instruments at all of those different epochs in Mars's geologic evolution and learn about the history of the planet? Uh, and it would be great, and we hope to do that, but we can't do it with the rovers that we have today. So the start of rock climbing robot actually predates me joining JPL. Uh, I was in graduate school at Stanford, and we were working on vertical climbing robots um, actually for the military um, to try and climb up uh, the outsides of brick buildings. So this robot was made by Boston Dynamics. Many folks know them for making robots like Big Dog and Atlas, um, Wildcat. They're a very um, uh, good company for making robots. This is a lesser known robot called Rise, and I worked on building the feet for this robot uh, with my lab at Stanford University. The professor there is Mark Kukoski. Um, it used the first versions of microspines, um, which used gravity just to engage themselves. So this robot would only climb in a straight line, straight vertically. A couple of years later, I took a little bit of break from my PhD for five or six weeks and worked for the Discovery Channel on a show called Prototype This. And I'm guessing many of you didn't see it because it got canceled after the first season. Um, but here, we're showing paddles where Lynn, who's a professional rock climber, is scaling the outside of a parking garage in downtown Oakland. Each one of those panels has 1,500 microspines, which is why it took me six weeks um, to make them. And I was very excited. This was the first time we had, we had taken them out and tried them, and so a huge relief, a younger, skinnier, very happy version of me there in the red shirt. <laughs> So I mentioned these innovations before. When I came to JPL, the question was, how can we use these climbing robot technologies for NASA applications? So on Mars, it's not a brick wall. It's a cliff face, right? So the same three things I mentioned. Conform to the roughness, opposing microspines so you can resist forces in any direction, and make them out of space-grade materials. And so that's what we did. You can see us testing, pulling these in different angles because we've got that um, opposed gripper. Again, notice this doesn't look like the ones I've showed you before. We go through iteration after iteration. We make tons of prototypes. We have a big wall full of dead, dead prototypes that's fun to look at if you ever get to, to take a tour. Here you can see testing again at, at different angles. And we test it on all different kinds of rocks. You'll notice the bottom line there says uh, limited performance on granular materials. These are things like pebbles, uh, sand, regolith, um, powder, that sort of thing. And I'll tell you a secret. In an academic paper or in a, a, a talk like this, if you see something that says limited performance, that means zero. So <laughs> this is really a technology for consolidated rock, right? If you want to grip the sand dune or the, the regolith field on the asteroid or the comet, uh, you need a different kind of gripper. You might use the same kind of robot. You might use the same uh, uh, autonomy and the same perception system. But you're going to want like a, a beach umbrella kind of gripper, uh, something that's meant for sand or these uh, unconsolidated materials. So a cool spin-off we got to do, because we're able to make these grippers pretty quickly, uh, is we made a hand-actuated version of the gripper that was, uh, would function in salt water. So this is a neutral buoyancy test bed that the astronauts use to practice um, mocking up their missions. 
Buzz Aldrin, way back in the Apollo day, realized that if you wanted to practice zero gravity for a long time, you know, one way is on the vomit comet, but another way is in a scuba suit, where you can make yourself neutrally buoyant, which is actually a pretty good simulation for what it's like to be in zero gravity. And so here they're using microspine grippers to anchor themselves to the floor, uh, which is a simulated surface of Phobos. Phobos is a, uh, one of the moons of Mars. And then they're doing other operations, other samples. The moons at Mars are way, way smaller than the moons of Earth. Uh, so they're actually microgravity environments like an asteroid or a comet. I think there's actually some debate about whether those moons are captured asteroids or if they're actually truly moons. Here's the rock climbing robot. Um, this was a video we put together a couple years ago. So just like you see different iterations of the, ro of the grippers, we have different versions of the robot. So this is lemur 2B. So there's a lemur 1, 2, 2A, 2B. We actually have a lemur 3 now, which I'll show you. Uh, in just a moment. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit if I can here. Let's see. That's the more exciting part. So this is sped up as well because when we um, did this project, Lemur 2B already existed. So we said, hey, can we just use this robot with our grippers? Again, try and prototype and demonstrate something as fast as we can. Uh, and uh, Brett Kennedy, who had designed and built this robot, said, sure. But I designed it to have a peg for a leg which is only weighs, you know, 100 grams. And I came along and put a one kilogram gripper on the end, so it's, it's uh, at the maximum amount of torque that the motors can, uh, can put out in order to do these kinds of motions. So all of the videos are sped up quite a bit. But as you might know, going fast for, for JPL is not necessarily a priority. It's safety and reliability that are more important. So curiosity on the surface of Mars at most goes about 100 meters in a day. So if you had a rock climbing robot that might be able to go two or three meters in a day over the course of a year or two years, you're actually going to cover that cliff face from top to bottom. So here's lemur three. You can see it's got a lot more joints. With more joints, uh, it's able to do more complex motions. So lemur two only had three degrees of freedom per limb. Um, which meant three motors that could turn uh, in any given axis. Lemur 3 has seven degrees of freedom per limb, which is similar to what you have in a human arm. So it can put its foot any place in space at any orientation, plus have one extra degree of freedom to enable it to move its body around or, or do other sorts of things. Now, this is not a test wall in our lab. One of my favorite parts of the job is that we get to go camping with the robots, and we go out and we do field tests. So this is at a pretty spectacular cave um, called El Mal Pais in New Mexico. Well, El Mal Pais is the national monument. The cave itself is called Big Skylight Cave. Uh, you can guess why. Um, and so we climb down in here, and we have the robot um, practicing on the side of this lava tube. Lava tubes are really interesting because we see them on Mars. So you can see our field site that we practice on in New Mexico on the right, and you can see a picture that was taken from an orbiter at Mars on the left, and the similarities are really remarkable. What you'll notice as the difference is that our lava tubes on Earth are smaller. So 20 meters versus 50 meters. Turns out the size of the lava tube seems to correlate to the amount of gravity that exists on that uh, uh, planet or body. So on Earth, we see 20, 30 meter max. On Mars, we see 50, some even at 100 meters. On the Moon, we can see them up to 200 meters in diameter. So you can imagine that is a giant cave. Now, caves are really interesting because they're preservation environments. So if you get into a cave, the environment is relatively stable. It never gets too hot, never gets too cold. On Mars and the Moon, you're protected from radiation as well. So samples that may be susceptible to that radiation haven't volatilized and escaped. Um, you may have things that are, are preserved. It's no accident that we find cave paintings from early man in caves. It wasn't that they didn't like painting out in the light. It was that all of the paintings on the cliff walls got washed away and weathered away uh, over time. So the only ones we find now are in the caves. Here's another picture of caves on Mars. We actually have thousands of these skylights that we've observed. And you can see here several of them along a sinuous rill. It sure looks to me like that's a cave that's probably connected underground. And you can see from the scale bar, it's several miles 
uh, in length. The other thing that's good about having a preservation environment is if you're a person, you're not getting cancer uh, being blasted by that radiation on the surface. So it may be that um, we evolved from cave people and we will return to being cave people uh, when we visit Mars and the moon to protect ourselves from that radiation when we sleep. Now, caves are amazing, but you might also want to visit those cliff faces, um, as I mentioned before, and there's plenty of them on Mars. Um, the Grand Canyon equivalent on Mars, Valles Marineris, is actually much, much larger than our Grand Canyon. So you can imagine a pretty epic mission having a robot climb from top to bottom or bottom to top. And just to emphasize the point, I don't know how many people have seen these photos. They were published by Curiosity uh, and, the, and the Mars Science Laboratory team just a few weeks ago. But these are at Murray Buttes in Gale Crater, and they really show some spectacular cliff faces, and I would love to have that be our next test site. And just to emphasize, the cameras that they have now uh, on these missions are incredible. The detail we see, the layering that you see, um, there's so much to explore beyond what's on the floor. So rock climbing robots are good for cliff faces and for caves. They may also be good for microgravity. So moving in microgravity is more of a climbing problem than a walking problem. If you let go in microgravity, you fall off, right? So Itakawa, which is the asteroid that the Japanese visited, um, it's about 500 meters across the long part of that potato, and it has the equivalent of 0.0003% of Earth's gravity. And that's pointing sort of in weird directions as well because that's not a perfectly spherical body. So if you jumped off the surface of Itakawa, no doubt you end up in outer space never to come back. Right? If you drop a baseball on the surface, it takes many minutes for it to fall down and hit the ground. So keeping yourself anchored to the surface is a good idea. Now these bodies are littered with boulders and, and other kinds of terrain that we might uh, want to crawl around on. As I mentioned, the microspines are good for consolidated rock. We might have that auger or that beach umbrella for the weaker granular materials. The picture on the right was taken by the Rosetta mission. That's uh, Comet 67P. I would say CG, that, that name is, is tremendously long. Um, and these are incredible pictures, but wouldn't you like to have a rover on that body the same way we have a rover on Mars? If you did, you might start at one lobe, um, and traverse across the neck and onto the other lobe. Uh, there's a hypothesis that 67P might have been two comets that got fused together. We don't have a great way of testing that um, because there's redistribution of the granular materials on the surface. So if that fusion happened, uh, it's kind of been obscured by now. But if we could drill, if we could get under the surface, we could learn all kinds of secrets about uh, the history of that comet. So you can see places I've marked with red X's as example locations in different geographical units that we might try and drill. Here's just a, a closer in picture example pathways that we might take. And I'll wrap up with our, our beautiful artist concept of what a rover mission on the surface of an asteroid or comet would look like. Um, I was told though, actually if the Earth is this big in the picture, it's a bad day for the Earth, right? We might need that, <laughs> that asteroid deflection technology. But it makes, it makes for a good picture. OK, so chapter three is gecko-like adhesives. Uh, gecko adhesives are very different than the claw-based approaches I've been talking about. You'll sometimes hear me refer to them as on-off adhesives, because one of the uh, most remarkable properties is a gecko can turn the stickiness of its foot on and off, depending on which way it's pulling on it. So imagine having duct tape that you could switch whether it's sticky or not sticky. So geckos, amazing, nature's best climber by far. Um, that adhesive is reusable. We've actually tested it with some colleagues, 30,000 cycles, and the gecko adhesive didn't wear out. You can imagine if you're a gecko and your foot stops sticking after 10 steps, um, you're quickly a dead gecko, which is, is bad. Um, that on-off behavior, and the physics behind this is van der Waals forces. Um, and if you remember your high school physics, van der Waals forces are the temporary and weak uh, interactions uh, that you get between two electron clouds. So you bring neutral atoms very close together. Those electrons are flying around all over the place. They don't stay in one spot. So at any given minute, if you slice the atom in half, few more electrons may be on one side than on the other. 
And if those atoms are really close together, they're going to induce a matching polarity in the electron clouds that are close by. So you get this net attractive force called Van der Waals forces. Way weaker than electromagnetic forces, way weaker than if the atom is missing an electron and the other one has an extra electron and you've got a, a covalent bond or something like that. But the gecko can use those forces because of all the tiny hairs it has on its feet. Now, some, some great videos of geckos here. One toe supporting its entire body weight, so it's really sticky. And that's on glass, by the way. And if you look on the video on the right, you can see some really rich um, uh, 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 biology going on with the curving spine and the trot gait, and it's, it's curling its toes. Geckos could go from the floor to the ceiling in here in about two seconds. They take 10 steps per second. Now imagine trying to peel duct tape and put it back on the surface 10 times in one second. You can't because you can't turn the stickiness of duct tape off. But because the gecko, when it pulls down on the adhesive, is sticky, and when it releases that weight is unsticky, it can fly up the wall. So to really appreciate the gecko, you have to have a microscope. So geckos have this hierarchical structure of tiny hairs. The only ones you can see with your eye are up here in the upper left. They're called lamellae, and they're flaps. They look like flaps that are on the sort of millimeter scale. Growing on each of those flaps is a forest of hairs, tiny hairs called setae, that are about five microns in diameter, maybe 100 microns in length. For reference, a human hair is about 100 microns in diameter. So these hairs are 20 times smaller than the hair on your head. They grow at an angle as well, which is important. At the ends of those hairs, though, down here, you see it kind of tufts like a head of broccoli. And that's because you have branches. Each one of those hairs tufts into dozens, if not hundreds, of branches that are at the single micron scale, really, really small. And those branches terminate in spatulae, which are only tens of nanometers thick and 100, 200 nanometers across. And they kind of look like a spatula, although that's a coincidence with, with the name. Those are what makes contact with the surface and what uses those van der Waals forces to stick. So the genius of the gecko system is that it has this intricate suspension structure behind those spatulae that help it conform to the surface and load share uh, without pushing the animal back off the wall. I can jam my hand into a surface and generate some van der Waals forces, but because the deflection of the tissue in my hand is, is greater in terms of a spring back force than the adhesion I get from the van der Waals forces, I can't climb up the wall, unfortunately. That would be great. But a gecko can do it. Now, manufacturing something that intricate is still probably 50 years out. We just don't have the technology to make something like the gecko is able to grow. We can make things at the nanoscale, like nanotubes. We can make things at the millimeter scale. But making them together and non-coplanar and branching, um, it's, it's just too much. So as an engineer, I don't want to wait 50 years for the technology to come around. So we do biomimetics. Uh, We're not trying to copy the gecko. We're trying to learn the lessons and apply them in our robots. So one of the lessons is this directionality. You can see this hair has an angle. These hairs are about 20 microns across the base. So they're about five times smaller than the hair on your head. Um, and they're made out of a silicone rubber. So gecko hairs are actually made out of beta keratin, which is like a fingernail or lizard skin. Um, it's rough. We cheat by using a rubbery-like material, not a sticky material, but something a little softer that, that lets us get a little bit more adhesion, just because we can't match that geometry. You can see that same property. If you pull the gecko hairs along the surface, they bend over. You get a high real area of contact, lots of van der Waals forces, and they stick. Um, if you push them in the opposite direction or you don't load them at all, it's only the very tips of these hairs. It's only this point right here that makes contact with the surface. And you don't have any Van der Waals forces. It doesn't stick. We add a tip to these features. We've been collaborating with uh, Elliot Hawks and uh, my old advisor, Mark Kukowski, at Stanford. We've really never stopped working together since I was a, a young master's student to add this mushroom-shaped tip. And that gives you about twice the adhesion because you have a, a thin film effect at the, at the edges. So the way we make these, um, I'll try and do it very quickly. I'm going to speak MEMS technology here for a minute. So if you don't understand, don't, don't worry. Um, we use a quartz wafer, and then we hard mask that in, in metal. 
so that we can um, do an exposure through that wafer. Quartz is transparent to UV light, so we can have um, UV light come through this wafer from the backside and expose um, where we haven't blocked it off. We then align and do a vertical <laughs> exposure and, and then develop, and what you end up with is a mold. So we have a negative version of the, that shape that we can cast into over and over again. So we use that silicone rubber, which starts kind of like five minute epoxy. It's, it's two parts of liquid, you mix it together, you pour it in, and voila, it, it solidifies and you can peel it out. You can do that over and over again. To, to understand the behavior, we test that at all different angles. So we pull on that gecko material with shear or with no shear, and the key point here is this goes through the origin, which means if you don't pull across the surface, it doesn't stick. And if you release that force across the surface, it comes off. You can see with the more force along the surface you have, the more stickiness you have. This axis is your stickiness, and this axis is your pulling along the surface. Um, and that maxes out at some point, uh, and then you kind of asymptote. So I'll get back to a more interesting thing. Here's the first robots that we were testing um, with this gecko-like adhesive. We called it StickyBot. In fact, this is StickyBot 2. So I was learning iterative design uh, even when I was in school. Uh, you can see it's very gecko-like in more ways than just the feet. Uh, Sangbae Kim was the main guy who designed the robot. I really worked on the feet for this robot. He's now a professor at MIT. You may have seen his cheetah robots um, if, you've, if you've seen any of the YouTube videos. I like to joke, you know, people in Thailand come down and they see a, a gecko running up their kitchen cupboard. Uh, in our lab at Stanford, we would come down and we would see a robot gecko running up the, up the cupboard. This gecko used gravity to engage that on-off behavior. So again, it only climbed in a vertical straight line um, against gravity. We have to do a trick um, if we're going to get it to work in zero gravity uh, in space. And it's the same trick a gecko does, actually. You can see here, if a gecko's sideways on a wall, it orients its feet so that gravity is pointing a, in the preferred direction to make their feet sticky. And if they flip upside down to go head first down the wall, they actually rotate their feet, again, so that they're in the preferred direction, so gravity turns the stickiness on. The first person to observe this, or at least the first person to write it down, was actually Aristotle in one of his books. So a kind of cool side note is I got to cite Aristotle in my PhD thesis, which I thought was great. Now, so we use that trick to our advantage in the same way we do with the microspines. Put two gecko pads in opposition, squeeze together, and you're going to get an adhesive anchor that can support loads in any direction. You can do it with two pads, you can do it with a lot of pads. Of course, since it's supposed to work in zero G, we got to take it on the airplane, test it out. So here's me grappling a free-floating cube uh, during one of those zero-G moments. So this is a video, again, collaborating with Stanford um, to demonstrate some of the properties of these grippers. Uh, one of the key things is you don't have to push it into the surface. You just have to pull along the surface. So unlike duct tape, again, where you have to sort of make sure it's pressed down firmly to get it to stick well, with a gecko-like adhesive, you just touch it to the surface and it sticks. And similarly, you can release it with zero force. It doesn't fall or push that plate away. Um, when he lets go. We've done testing here at JPL in a thermal vacuum chamber, um, so it does work in the environment you find in space, minus 60 Celsius, full vacuum. We've done over 30,000 cycles with our synthetic gecko adhesive. And here we're demonstrating one of the use cases where we might try and grapple a piece of orbital debris, a piece of space garbage, and try and tow it out of the way, make sure it doesn't hit um, astronauts like that movie Gravity, uh, make sure that, that we can protect our assets. Now, we wanted to test a 100 kilogram cube, um, which is basically a refrigerator. And we asked NASA, can we fly a refrigerator inside the airplane? And they said, heck no. Um, and so we were bummed for a couple of days until one of our students, Jonathan there, said, you know, I'm about 100 kilograms. And so we put a vest on him, and he became the uh, high inertia target. And that's one of our other interns at the time who now works here um, grappling him. Another facility we have at JPL to test in, in a zero-G-like environment is the Robodome, or the Formation Control Test Bed. It's like a giant air hockey table, but these robots are pumping the air out the bottom instead of the air coming through the table. The robots weigh about 800 pounds each, but you can push them with your pinky. Um, and in this demonstration, we used thrusters on the gold robot 
to chase down the blue one, grapple it with the gecko adhesive, and tow it back to a set position. So this is a mission that you might see in space. If you're grappling a satellite that's gone out of its preferred orbit and putting it back in place, maybe doing repair, refueling um, on that satellite. Of course, I'm a roboticist, and so I want to see robots crawling around on everything. Here's an artist concept of a robot inspecting the outside of the space station. And if we send humans to Mars, that journey to Mars, you may find robots to maintain that space station, make sure it's functioning, do, do light repairs. So we've done some work on this as well. In this case, we're using a, a counterweight to reduce the gravity uh, and allow us to, to climb around in zero G. Now I knew you guys were gonna be a smart audience and so I sped up the video that was already sped up. So any of those numbers you see, multiply by three. Um, so you can see it gripping and releasing. And you can see this is lemur three, just with different feet. We use lemur three for rock climbing with the microspines. We use lemur three for um, ISS inspection kinds of uh, uh, challenges with gecko grippers. Now earlier this year, my first piece of hardware got sent to space. This was in May. Um, I did not take this picture, but I was uh, very close to this spot, and my picture looks nothing like this. Um, but, but here's a resupply mission going to the ISS. It was a night launch. It was, it was awesome to see it go. And we put a few gecko grippers in the hands of the astronauts. So here's Jeff Williams. Uh, he's attached a gecko gripper to the bulkhead, and then he's going to take out a force gauge and tug on it and measure the force. We also had them leave those grippers in place for a few weeks just to demonstrate that it doesn't wear out, doesn't need any power to stay attached. And my favorite part right here, this is the first time he does it, he thinks it's gonna pull off, and then he realizes, oh, I gotta brace myself because that's a, that's a sticky gripper. Um, there are uh, opportunities to use this technology here on Earth. Um, we've partnered with a startup company called Perception Robotics that's here in uh, LA that wants to put gecko grippers onto the factory floor to do pick and place operations, those kinds of things. Um, and they sent me this picture one day, which I was not expecting, uh, where they were at a small business uh, event and President Obama and Chancellor Merkel stopped by and I actually built that gripper um, that we had given to the company to, to do testing and demonstrations with. So they sent me this picture and I said, not, holy cow. So we're on to the fourth chapter, and we're going to do a rapid-fire kind of whirlwind through some of the early-stage prototypes uh, we have in the lab. So we've put some of these adhesive technologies onto wheeled robots. We're trying to miniaturize robots, get them as small as possible. So you can see here the microspines climbing up rough surfaces. Um, and you'll notice there's no safety line. We try and make these sort of crash-proof uh, so that they can survive if they, if they are to fall off or if we intentionally drive them off. This was especially fulfilling because we eat lunch right next to these stairs. So we'd look at it every day and say, one day we're going to have the robot climb up those stairs. You see Kalen Carpenter there uh, controlling the robot. He did most of the work here to, to make that a reality. So it was another fun day when we were out at the tallest brick building we could find. It's about six stories. The robot made it all the way to the top, and then we realized that the latch to the roof was locked, and we couldn't get up there. Uh, so we brought out a fishing net and tried to catch it when we made it fall off, and um, we missed. <laughs> so one story kind of falls. We, we, can, we can survive. That six story was, was a little tough. But here you can see some of our impact uh, testing. Um, the robot keeps going. Now, it's the same robot, but here it's got a different kind of wheel. These are the electrostatic wheels that I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, so they operate at a very high voltage, about 5,000 volts, but they are only creating a charge differential. So they're not powering anything. They're just keeping the charge between the pad and the, and the surface. The reason the balloon falls off the wall after a while is because that charge differential bleeds off into the air. So you hook up a circuit to the balloon after you rub it on your head. It'll stay up there as long as your battery you know, has power. So the electrostatic adhesives, we're partnering with Matt Spenko at Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, and these are used, uh, you know, electrodes that are sort of interstitial like this, powered at that very high voltage. I put one equation 
in the entire talk because I felt like you have to have one equation. But it's a really easy one. So it says the force you get from this is a product of the polarizability of the material, you know, how easy it is to create an electric field in it. So metals are really high, clay and things are really low, and the strength of your electric field. Of course, we've got a new robot. We've got to test it in the zero-g airplane. Um, so here we're showing the first demonstrations of zero-g mobility, uh, I think, ever. I think this is the first robot that's ever um, climbed around uh, in zero-g. We have had some free flyers that are sort of hovering and, and fly around. This is the first crawler that I know of. So here's a, a spare solar panel. This was actually an extra from a satellite that went up to GEO. Um, the, the slide before uh, was mylar, which is a common thermal blanket material. So the outsides of spacecraft are covered in these kinds of things. Uh, here Christine is grappling a one meter cylinder. Uh, we chose one meter and aluminum because that's the materials of the Thor booster. So back in the 60s and 70s, we weren't so concerned about all the garbage that we put up in space. And there's hundreds of boosters that are about that diameter. So we're demonstrating the ability to grapple one of those. And it wouldn't be cost effective to do that with all of them. But if one of them's coming to hit a very high value asset, like the International Space Station, it'd be great to, to protect yourself from that. Here's an inchworm style version using gecko-like materials. It's a lot slower, so it was only taking one step each parabola. Uh, and then we're having some fun at the end, uh, testing out the robot on, on these curved surfaces. So we've also done some rapid prototyping with a volcano bot. Uh, this is Carolyn Parchetta. Uh, she's, she's bold, and, and, and I'm terrified when we're here. This is in Hawaii. Uh, she came to our lab and wanted to uh, image underground conduits for fissure-style eruptions. Now, Carolyn is a volcanologist. She has her doctorate in, in um, geology and volcanology. But she came to our lab and, and asked us to build a robot with her um, to image these underground vents. She had taken LIDAR and imaged them from the surface. But because the vents have some sinuosity to them, she's only able to get about two or three meters deep. LIDAR only works line of sight. Um, so I love, I love this robot because it's really a great example of the methodology we try and embrace in the lab. We used 3D printers, motors we already had on the shelf, Arduino microcontrollers that we already had code for. We basically duct taped a robot together as fast as we could. And she and I were out in the field in Hawaii about four months later testing that robot with an Xbox Connect um, as the sensor, right? Off the shelf system to map that underground conduit. And she had spent her PhD um, studying these same fissures and had gotten that LiDAR data. And even though the robot on that first trip only worked about 20% of the time, spent most of our days in the hotel room trying to fix it, uh, we were able to get some data that was first of its kind. Um, where we're imaging the fissure, we went all the way down to 40 meters, and we ran out of tether. So from 3 meters to now 40 meters. And we iterated on that, and we went back this past spring. And the third or fourth version of the robot basically worked from dusk until dawn for two straight weeks. And we have a map now of the entire conduit system um, of, of one of these fissure eruptions. So if you look at that data that you get back, it's generally point cloud data. We're interested in this for some of our rock climbing robots as well. Um, this is the kind of thing you get back. Um, and we're interested in ways to visualize that data besides just showing it on a computer screen. So we may try and integrate it into some of those virtual reality goggles so you could actually have a scientist be inside that fissure where they would never fit. These fissures are only about 20 to 30 centimeters wide. Uh, one more video here. We're showing a quad rotor that's able to land on the side of a building. Um, we use a quad rotor because we have an atmosphere here. If you're in space, you might have a, a propulsive robot like the Spheres robot. Uh, we're making a new version of that called Astro B up at Ames Research Center. You could use a gripper like this to attach yourself to dock to the space station or a satellite, uh, hang out for a while, save your propellant, and then take off again. And I think this is, this is my last set of slides here. Um, I just want to uh, voice how fun a job this is, um, what a toy shop we seem to have. I know uh, my garage at home will never be as, as full as my lab is here with equipment. So we've gotten a lot of support from our section as well as the JPL uh, leadership uh, to make these things happen. Um, so this is where we spend a lot of our time. 
Uh, we also spend a lot of time here in the machine shop. Um, every once in a while, we go to the very high-tech facilities here at JPL to test in a space-like environment. And as you know, on the good days, I get to um, have a little fun inside the zero-g airplane or have a lot of fun out in the field with the robots. Um, and of course, part of NASA's mission is outreach. Uh, and so it's always uh, great fun to do talks like this and get to share our work uh, with the public. So that's it. Um, I think a few people in here have worked on some of what I've shown. So I'd ask those people to also sort of stand up um, and receive a, a round of applause along with, with me. And I'll be happy to take some questions as well. Thank you very much. It appears my team is either too shy or they didn't want to come tonight. <laughs> yeah, so if for questions, if we can have you go to the microphone in the middle there, just so uh, folks online can, can hear the question as well. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering if the hooks uh, wear out, get blunt, become less effective yeah, over time. That's an excellent question. Uh, the hooks do wear out over time. For the asteroid redirect mission, we only have to grip the boulder once, or if we, if we fail, we have the ability to try uh, two more attempts. So they don't really wear out over that uh, length of time. The way they wear out, though, is if you yank them off the surface. So they only really wear quickly in a failure case. Um, if you're just gripping and then releasing during the normal operation, they wear very slowly. And we've done thousands of cycles of that kind of grip. But when we try and test the max force that they hold, uh, they do dull over the course of 10, 20 cycles. Um, yeah. Yeah. Question. Um, did you think about the possibility of a sooty or gritty or even oily contaminants on the surface of some of the aluminum objects that the gecko adhesive was designed yeah. to remove? Yeah, that's a good question as well. So the surface um, matters a lot for the gecko adhesives. So the smoother, the better. Um, it, because we don't have all of that intricate hierarchy that the, the, the animal has, we can only grip pretty smooth surfaces. Um, and then the dirtiness of that surface, or if it's oily or wet, uh, will also degrade the performance. Um, you don't see that problem as much with geckos because they're able to use a stiffer material. And so they're more resilient to dust and debris and things like that. Good news is uh, in space, um, the surfaces are generally much cleaner than they are in our lab. Um, which is a, a mess. <laughs> yeah. A number of the uh, robots that climbed up a vertical surface had a tail, and I wonder if there's a function to that. Yeah, uh, you guys have great questions. The tail is very important. Um, if all you have is the two wheels in the front, the robot's going to spin around. So the tail reacts the moment that keeps you from, from falling back. And tails are actually really important in, in biology as well for balance. But there's a, I didn't show the video, but geckos, uh, we, we've worked with some folks that do some uh, interesting things like put slippery surfaces and then make the geckos try and climb across them. So these are great videos. You watch the gecko climbing up the wall, and then all of a sudden it's like it's stepped on a banana and it starts slipping. And what they do at that point is they actually push their tail as hard as they can into the wall. So they're falling backwards. And they use the tail as a self-writing uh, mechanism to, to regain their grip. So yeah, tails are really critical. And um, what you see on ours are passive tails. They're just a pole that reacts that moment. I think in the future, we'd like to make those tails active the same way a, an animal's tail is, is active and able to do those kinds of fault responses and, and things like that. Yeah, other questions? Great talk. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, what about the timelines for these projects or the groups of people? Like how many work on these, especially in the earlier versions of rapid prototypes? And yeah. Uh, so the projects will range uh, in duration from a few months, where you're just trying to show the first version of the prototype, uh, and uh, to a few years, uh, where you really have some higher level objectives. The asteroid redirect mission, we started about a year and a half ago, formally. Um, and that's uh, currently targeting a launch in 2021. So that's a very long timeline. We have to deliver our hardware in uh, a year and a half before the actual launch. Um, but that gives you a sense of the timelines. Um, when you're at a lower uh, level of 
development, those prototypes can happen very quickly, a couple of weeks, um, and you can build them maybe one or two people. Uh, as you get up to a more complex robot, the rock climbing robots, it's a team of about five. Um, the asteroid grippers, right now we're a team of about seven, but that's going to grow to a peak of about 12 or 13 of us, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, cable tensed structures that are pulled through tubes as opposed to a stepper motor actuated rigid arms? Yeah, uh, sure. So we do use cables to actuate um, parts of our grippers and other parts of the robots. Uh, cables are nice because they only act in one direction. So you can pull on them and, and have tension, but when, for instance, those fingers flop down on the surface, if one flops down early, the cable just goes slack, um, as opposed to a bar which would get jammed. Um, now the downside is that you gotta do cable management um, and, and routing all those cables, making sure they're the right length. I've learned all my Boy Scout knots late in life um, dealing with those kinds of systems. So it's, a, it's always an engineering trade between what you're trying to have the system do and, and, um, and, and what your engineering parameters are. Another thing, maybe you were asking about this, is cables can be used to change the stiffness of a structure sometimes. Those are called tensegrity robots. Actually, your human body is a tensegrity structure. The tendons and muscles are in uh, tension, keeping uh, uh, your, your stiffness different than if you were just standing on your bones alone. So some folks are working in robotics where they're using cables uh, and tensioning those cables to try and give the robot a different level of stiffness. Um, in our lab, we haven't really worked on that yet. Um, there's some ideas floating around, but, but we're not going down that path right now. And on an extension for the, the cable concept, mm -hmm. how are they actuated? Is it solenoids or is it cams? And if it is solenoids, how would that function in magnetically active environments like yeah. the Van Allen belts? So none of, none of what you saw today was a, a solenoid. Um, in a prototyping, a lot of times we use servo motors or just brushed DC motors. Um, a lot of times as well, we're trying to do under actuation. So when those um, carriages lift up, it's one motor that's powering all 16 of those, right? We're just pulling on a plate that has all of those cables attached to it. Um, in flight, a lot of times we use brushless uh, DC motors because the brushes uh, uh, can create debris and uh, don't work quite as well in vacuum. Um, so we use those as well sometimes. It's sort of a, uh, each job requires maybe a different, uh, a, a different consideration. Yeah. Nice. It's too tall for me. Okay. Hi. This is very exciting, so thank you um, for this talk. Um, I was wondering what the current use rate of 3D printing is for you guys, and is there a plan or a roadmap to increase that to a certain percentage, um, whether it be for efficiency or just you know ease of building maybe what doesn't exist? Yeah, so I would say, well, we have, let's see, we've gone through probably 12 or 15 different 3D printers in the last five years or so. Uh, we bring in some of the low-cost hobby kind of grade ones uh, that we use for quick, dirty prototypes, and we turn our students loose on those. We also have some high-end printers that uh, we call them the Ferrari because the price tag is kind of equivalent. Um, but across the board, those printers run every day for us. So uh, at times during the summer, which is our busiest uh, season, we have queues uh, of people waiting to, to print parts. So in a prototyping phase, they're in use constantly. And we've tried to open up that lab space to the broader JPL community as well. So we have people from all different sections, all different departments coming by to, to print parts um, because they, they uh, have a need for them. Uh, so it's, the adoption rate has been really quick. I think it's gonna continue to grow. Uh, one area that we haven't um, really moved into yet but I think is coming is metal 3D printing. So we have filament style printers, we have uh, uh, liquid UV resin kinds of printers, uh, and I think the metal uh, printers are, are coming next. We've outsourced some parts. We use local shops and vendors all the time as well. So we've had some titanium printed parts um, that we've used, but I think JPL is gonna uh, get on board and get some of our own machines there soon as well. Um, people are actually looking into flying 3D printed parts as part of the spacecraft. So. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, and I think it's going to happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
It looked like a number of your uh, robots were autonomous. There weren't any cables attached or anything. Mm -hmm. Could you talk briefly about what kind of controllers they have on board to have direction and move the limbs and all of that? Yeah, so autonomy is an interesting um, thing. We don't think of autonomy as on or off. We think of it as a slider between fully teleoperated um, and fully autonomous. And so on some of the robots, that slider is kind of in the middle. Uh, if you're climbing up a wall and you're trying to steer looking at a camera, turns out the wall looks the same whether you're you know, 15 degrees to the left or 15 degrees to the right. So what we do is we augment the user by uh, steering to match the gravity vector, right? So this is sort of autonomy, but it's also still being controlled um, by, a, by an operator. On the, the further side, for the rock climbing robots, we are trying to make that much more autonomous, where we give it waypoints that are maybe a few meters ahead of where it is, and it decides how to move its limbs and where the good places to grip are. Turns out that a person trying to sort of joystick a seven degree of freedom limb is actually not, not very good. It's too complex for you to work out in your head which motor has to move at which time, uh, and you don't have enough buttons on the controller to do it anyways. And so we try and use a lot more autonomy, move that slider uh, closer to a fully autonomous state for some of the rock climbing robots. Um, and what yeah. do you use on board for a process like an Arduino? So no, so the rock climbing robot right now has uh, two brains, if you will. It's got a, a low brain that's a PC-104 stack. So it's a bunch of cards. It's actually pretty old. Um, electronics technology, and then it has an Intel Nuke, um, which is a, a much more powerful computer that's doing the higher level uh, computer vision work and the trajectory generation, and then those two have to talk to each other. Um, so the, the lower brain handles, you know, make the motor spin, and that uh, Intel computer handles the where do I put my foot and how do I move all of my joints. <coughs> Thank you. Sure. Hi. Hello. Um, so uh, I have a question about the adhesive um, gecko robot. Sure. So you guys are planning to deploy that on a mission to Mars, right? So um, my question is that um, the weather on Mars are much harsher than it is here on Earth. So have you guys thought about something like how, how to tackle that when it hit a storm or something like that? Yeah, so the environment on Mars is, is obviously um, very extreme. Um, it, it's funny that our group name is Extreme Environment Robotics. You might think that the entire lab is really doing extreme environment um, robotics. So it's a consideration. In the prototyping phase, we haven't really been uh, too concerned about the thermal uh, environment or protecting ourselves from dust and debris. Uh, but as that robot matures, uh, we would bring in all of those folks from JPL who are really expert at managing, you know, the cold temperatures and the hot temperatures and managing the dust storms and some of those sorts of things. And I don't think there's any uh, critical limitations for the rock climbing robots uh, to, to operate on the surface of Mars. The gecko adhesives are really tailored more to smooth surfaces. So we wouldn't use those on Mars. We'd use the gecko adhesives in, in orbit to grapple satellites and operate maybe on the, on the sort of carrier ship that would go back and forth between Mars and, and Earth, but not actually on the surface where it's dirty and rough. All right, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. I think we have a couple questions from online, maybe, and, uh, and these have been screened, so these are the best ones, I think. Um, the question here is, what are the major challenges in moving the grippers from field tests to spaceflight tests? Um, that's a great question. Um, some of the challenges are technical, um, like figuring out how to make it robust across all of the different rock types. So it's easy when you're developing something in the lab to kind of design it to work on whatever you have in the lab. You take it out into the field and you realize, oh, this rock is actually a little different. Um, we're going to have to go back and, and fix some things. So some of the technical challenges are in making it uh, robust, making sure it doesn't break over time. Uh, but some of the other challenges to moving from, from the lab to spaceflight are actually programmatic. Um, you need to be in the right place at the right time. So if you're developing a technology that's really tuned for Venus and the next mission is going to Mars, 
um, you've got a mismatch there. And so there's always a little bit of um, awareness and strategy uh, that NASA and JPL is trying to stay on top of to make sure we're developing the right technologies for the, for the next missions. Um, so some of the challenges can be of that more personal uh, uh, or non-technical variety. Uh, I guess the other one which is a big driver is um, testing. Uh, the costs of doing environmental testing and really validating your technology can be uh, very high. So to do that on an R&D budget can be a real challenge. Um, and sometimes there's a mismatch between what a mission is willing to pay for and what the technology program is willing to pay for, um, where you have to try and prove that you're ready for the mission, but in order to do that testing, you need the dollars that are associated uh, with the mission. So sometimes it's trying to um, scrap together a, a, a story that really proves that it's going to work in, in that environment. So the second question here um, uh, is, are AI and machine learning technologies in use here? And if so, how? Uh, so the answer, AI and machine learning, um, they're definitely in use here at JPL. Uh, in the robots I showed you here today, we're not um, really doing much machine learning or AI. Uh, the one exception to that is we're trying to train um, the rock climbing robot on what is a good place to grip. And so we've just started collecting um, lots and lots of 3D models of different rock faces. And we're by hand highlighting these are good places to grip, these are bad places to grip. And then we're going to feed that into a, uh, into a program that will learn, hopefully from those examples, where those good places to grip are. Um, that's work that's just getting underway now. Um, but there's a lot more complex machine learning and AI that's happening uh, in other projects at JPL. So I'd encourage you to go to the JPL Robotics website. Uh, and there's lots of videos of, of some other robots that really emphasize um, those technologies. So that's, that's it. And uh, I'll stick around up front if people have. Well, we'll take one more question, I guess. Thank you. Go ahead. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> on the ARM project, when you bring the boulder uh, off the comet and you bring it to the moon and put it in orbit around the moon, yeah. um, you said that you were going to let companies uh, possibly go up there and practice mining and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that we'd be able to see uh, through a telescope? Um, I, I, I know you said it's as big as a SUV possibly yeah. uh, in orbit around the moon. And I was just wondering if that would be like uh, something we'd be able to see and how big is the orbit and how long would it take to go around? Yeah, so after we pull the boulder from the asteroid, uh, we'll put it in a what's called a retrograde orbit around the moon. So it's very stable and it'll be up there for uh, hundreds of years. Um, now, uh, I don't think it'll be large enough to see with most telescopes. I think you might be able to see a point source that, yeah, there's a you know signal or or uh, 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 you know, certainly we're going to be talking to the spacecraft, but I don't think optically you're probably going to be able to see that. But um, that's my 90% confidence answer. I'm not. I'm not for sure on that. It's a reflector on the yeah, yeah. But you'll get great videos when the crew come and dock with that uh, with that spacecraft in the boulder, and you, we'll probably see all of that happening um, in near real time down here on Earth. So that'll be very exciting. Thank you again for coming. It was my pleasure. Have a good evening.